Welcome everybody to the next iteration of the IIT seminar series. Today's speaker is Lauren Shoemaker from the University of Wyoming, and she is going to be talking about persistence and coexistence in variable environments. So uh, without further ado, Lauren, please, the floor is yours. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation and thank you all so much for putting this on. It's been wonderful to watch and also um, to be able to watch the recordings um, as well if there's times I can't make it. So I really appreciate this um, group. All right, so for today's talk, I'll be discussing persistence and coexistence across environmental variability and kind of linking from theory to how we can hopefully leverage this um, for restoration settings. So these ideas fit most broadly within kind of what I like to call the umbrella mystery of biodiversity. So trying to understand from a community context what mechanisms determine community composition, and in particular, how important are biotic interactions. So I'll be focusing primarily on competition between species of the same trophic level for this talk versus how important is the abiotic environment. So say variability in rainfall regimes. And kind of from a theoretical standpoint, what I find really intriguing about these ideas is that you can ask them across highly variable ecosystems, ranging from say highly diverse systems like a tropical forest shown here, less diverse systems such as a temperate grassland, or even then say thinking about protist or microbial uh, coexistence within a single droplet of water. And so it might be the same questions, but we may get really different answers kind of across these different systems and these different scales. Um, and then in particular with these ideas, I've been really inspired recently um, by a paper by Germaine et al from 2018 that I think does an excellent job highlighting that it's not just the abiotic environment and competition or interactions between species, but rather the interplay of both that really uh, impacts community composition. So to kind of motivate my talk today, um, I have a quick intro, um, but this is my kind of one key slide. So this is um, a graph from the Germain et al paper. We're looking at different annual species um, in California grasslands and their invasion growth rate in dry versus wet conditions. And so in this graph, a circle is a species and it's connected across these two conditions by this gray line. And what strikes me with this graph is that a lot of these lines have slopes pretty close to zero. So we have two vastly different environments and it doesn't seem to matter that much for these species, which is pretty surprising. If we look at the same results though, but now where you consider competition between species. So you have a competitive environment as well, you get a vastly different story. So you have really different uh, invasion growth rates of these species, including for many cases where it's positive under one condition, and then you get a negative um, or a growth rate that doesn't lead to persistence under a different condition. So using these ideas as motivation for my talk today, um, there's kind of three components I'll focus on. The first is examining how important environmental variability is for species coexistence, breaking that down a bit more and really focusing on how that impacts species interactions. And then the third part, which will actually be what I spend most of the talk today on, is how can we leverage these frameworks from theory to inform management and restoration? So to create this bridge, if you will, from theory to potentially more applied settings. And for all of these, um, I'll focus on work that's the integration of theory with field experiments as well. So there's two components. The first one will be kind of a more basic science theoretical understanding, looking at variability in California grasslands. And then the second will be extending this and seeing how we can modify coexistence theory to potentially create a framework for management. So we'll go ahead and jump into this first part of the talk. Um, and so this um, will take place in California annual grassland systems. And California grassland systems are known for their high variability, both in terms of the abiotic environment, but also what you see in terms of community composition. So it's a highly dynamical system consisting at this point primarily of annual um, invasion annual invaders. Um, so it's a highly invaded system. 
And in the California grassland system, one of the central dogmas is that you tend to have grasses in wet years and forbs in dry years. So we can see this really nicely in this recreation of a graph uh, from Pitt and Hetty from the 70s, where you have this really high variability in terms of the percent cover of your grasses and forbs. And the idea is that probably this is really driven by rainfall within that given year. So taking the first two kind of motivating questions for the talk today, we'll really kind of narrow in and focus on environmental variability in terms of the timing of rainfall and how that can alter coexistence potentially of a grass and a forb, and then how this might mediate species interactions and the impact of species interactions for coexistence. And this is um, a little bit of older work of mine. So it's in collaboration with Lauren Hallett, Katie Suding, and Caitlin White. Um, as a side note, Lauren Hallett is giving the next talk in two weeks um, and we'll be talking about some of our work on synchrony. So just a plug to tune in then if you're interested. Um, and while this is a little bit older of work, it's really motivated kind of the second part of my talk today. So I did wanna spend a couple minutes on kind of this more basic science theory side. So for this project, um, Lauren Hallett designed the field experiment, and we have a focal annual grass and a focal annual forb that we'll uh, use for the experiment. So the grass is a vena, the forb is a rhodium. And we'll look across four different rainfall conditions. So a control or ambient condition, one that's a consistent drought condition in the back. So where you have a rain out shelter on these plots throughout the experiment. And then a late season versus early season drought condition, which is created by taking up, uh, putting on or taking off the rain out shelter at some point through the growing season. So then within uh, these four different environmental treatments, we have a seeding treatment of our grass and a forb where we have what I like to call a density by ratio experiment. So we have three different densities of these seeds. So low, medium, and high. And we cross this with five different ratios, ranging from all of our grass, mainly our grass, equal ratios of the two, to mainly our forb, and then all forb. And we do this density by ratio um, experiment to allow us to use these data to then parameterize models that we can use with coexistence theory. So at the end of the growing season, we go ahead and count all of the stems in these experiments and the total number of seeds produced by focal individuals. And this allows us to couple these experimental results with um, coexistence models to estimate the parameters. So using this experiment, we go ahead and fit population models. So I'll walk you through what we use. It's the classic Beberton holt model. So let's go ahead and look at, say, the number of avena seeds at the end of our growing season. This is going to depend on the number of avena seeds we added. So what was that density and ratio treatment? And then what's the per individual kind of maximum seed production that you would expect? So without any intra or interspecific competition. And then we need to divide by the competitive effects, both of avena on itself, as well as then erodium's effect on avena. And then we fit an analogous model for erodium as well. So we've uh, fit these population models using our experimental treatments. And then to project these dy dynamics through time, there's one other component we have to consider, which is not just what's happening above ground within a single growing season, but what seeds are being maintained in the seed bank through time as well. So we'll take that model I showed before and just modify it a little bit so that now we also consider these germination rates from the seed bank. And then we can model the below ground dynamics of what seeds do not germinate in a given year, but do survive into the next year. So we take this kind of final model and we couple it with historical rainfall conditions from 1896 to 2016, taking each of those years and categorizing it to fit within one of our four different rainfall treatments that we have experimentally. We then can use this model to project dynamics through time of our grass in the light gray and our forb in the dark gray here. So this is 
note this as counts of seeds, um, but we can see that at least kind of anecdotally, it does seem to match that pit and heady graph I used to motivate this section where we have this really high temporal variability and our grass does seem to dominate over the fort. But this of course begs the question, do these two different functional groups actually coexist with one another? Or is one of them probably the forbs, maybe it's at lower abundances, actually um, expected to go locally extinct at some point in time? So to answer this, we go ahead and couple our model with modern coexistence theory, and in particular, using kind of a newer approach by Elmer et al. in 2019, that really allows us to look at coexistence and the mechanisms that might help maintain coexistence kind of in an empirical application. So using a bit more of a simulation-based approach. So to do this, we measure coexistence using what's called the mutual invasion criterion. So we'll kind of back up for a minute from our grass and forb, instead thinking of two kind of generic species, a blue square and a red circle. And for the mutual invasion criterion, what we do is we remove one species, let's say the red one from our system. This will then potentially cause a competitive release of our blue species. And then once it's settled at a new steady state distribution, we can go ahead and reinvade that red species back into the system at this low density. If it can increase, then we predict it will coexist with the blue species or if it has this negative low density or invasion growth rate, then we predict that it would be driven towards competitive exclusion. And then for the mutual invasion criteria, we repeat this process for every species of consideration. So for the blue one in this case. And this allows us to then quantify that invader growth rate for our two species. Again, if both are positive, we have stable coexistence of the two versus if one is negative, we would say it would be driven towards competitive exclusion. So using this framework, let's go ahead and look at our four different rainfall treatments. And let's focus on the grass first. So we can see that all of these bars are positive with a um, growth rate where we predict it can coexist with the forb regard regardless of rainfall treatment. For the forb, however, we have a different story. And in this case, actually having drought conditions is really critical for a forb to coexist with the grass, in particular, having these early season drought conditions. Um, so the fall is the start of the growing season here. And so then when we couple this again with what we actually find from our historical uh, climate data, we do see that we would predict our grass and forb will coexist with one another. So this helps us to answer the first question, and we can see that our grass, Sabina, does prefer early season rain, but it does great regardless of environmental variability. But having these fall droughts is necessary for our forb erodium to coexist with our grass. So to answer the second question, kind of diving into this role of species interactions for coexistence, there's one more component we need to add to our analyses. And so that's to take this low density growth rate of our species and to partition it into different mechanistic components. We do so using the exact same experimental data, but now using simulations to quantify the strength of different mechanisms that might promote coexistence. So we'll take this invader growth rate. And in this case, we'll look at four different mechanisms that might lead to coexistence. The first one is what's the growth rate if you have no environmental variability? So if you had um, no environmental uh, variability altering your lambda parameter or your competition between your two species, then using simulations, we basically turn on and off different types of variability. So what happens if the environment only alters competition between our species? Let's compare that then to what happens if our environmental variability would only alter seed production between our species. And then finally, what's the effect of having environmental variability alter both simultaneously? 
So we can go ahead and look at the strength of these four different mechanisms that overall sum to our invader growth rate. And so for Avena, our grass in particular, remember environmental variability, I said, doesn't seem to matter. It has a positive growth rate no matter what. And you can see this in our delta naught, so that purple mechanism, where if we have no environmental variability, it still has this quite positive invader growth rate. For rhodium though, which is the one where environmental variability seemed to matter more, in this case, actually having variability alter competition between species was what was really critical for stabilizing coexistence for our forb with our grass. So using this, we can see that again, our grass does not require variability, but actually the vi environmental variability altering competitive interactions for our forb is what was really critical for coexistence of our two different functional groups. And so more broadly, this highlights to me how it's really difficult to predict how species will respond to variability without also considering the broader community context. Or to put this pictorially, we oftentimes say in our models, consider how environmental conditions might alter um, maximum seed production. But from this work, we see it's also critical to consider how it will alter competition between species. And then we need to also even consider this interaction between the two. So taking these results, um, this really kind of motivated me for thinking about how we can take coexistence theory and extend it from these um, kind of theoretical frameworks to potentially use for on the ground management decisions. And so that's what I'll focus on for the rest of the talk today. And in particular, how can we leverage this information to inform management and restoration? Is it helpful to potentially manage for a species persistence as measured by this low density growth rate calculation that we've been using in the California grassland system? And then kind of diving into these different mechanisms, might it be helpful to manage for say, environmental conditions to manipulate the competitive neighborhood or both? And how might doing those alter species persistence? And so given uh, the audience for this talk, I wanted to just go ahead and kind of give a little bit more background for why I'm excited about these ideas. So going from theory and models to on the ground applications. And I've been really inspired by how as a community we've done this for both island biogeography and meta community theory and how kind of the big picture ideas of these theories as well as our models for them have been taken and applied, say, when thinking about what areas to protect with the Nature Conservancy and how you can maintain connectivities as species might move in response to climate change, or from Andy Gonzalez's lab on a like little bit more smaller scale within a single city, which areas are important to protect to help maintain biodiversity and again connectivity between different patches in a meta community. So for my talk then, this begs the question of, can we do something similar for coexistence theory? How can we take it from this more theoretical approach to on the ground applications? And for my own work, I'll argue that there's probably a lot more, but at least two kind of hurdles that we need to overcome. One is to better account for variability and how we propagate uncertainty in our models of coexistence and then the second one is how can we extend this framework from considering say a focal grass and forb, so two species, to more realistic observed diversity levels. So jumping into this first one, um, I've been really excited about connecting theory and our models of coexistence to Bayesian statistics and using a Bayesian framework as a way to propagate uncertainty in our different parameter estimates. So I've thrown up again this Beverton holt model that we used in the California grassland system. And each of these different colored parameters, we need to have an estimate for if we're interfacing theory with empirical models. And so oftentimes what we've done kind of previously in coexistence theory is we might use our mean estimate, maybe even some estimate of standard deviation around that mean. Yet 
I'll argue that each of these different parameters actually are different demographic rates, right? And we know that these demographic rates have distributions to this, them created, say, by demographic stochasticity, um, genetic variation among individuals, kind of a whole host of potential factors. And furthermore, many of these different parameters are highly non-normal. And so maybe taking into account this full distribution for these parameters is really important for propagating this uncertainty through to our measures of coexistence theory. Or in other words, what this means is kind of going from these bar graphs, if you will, of our invader growth rate for our two species to instead consider distributions of coexistence for our species. So even though our means shown in these dots here might both be positive, do our distributions overlap zero and have um, multiple potential outcomes? So we went ahead and applied this kind of framework of coupling Bayesian statistics with coexistence theory. Um, so we're going to move halfway around the world in terms of our empirical system we're focusing on. Um, so this is the York Gum Jam Woodland in uh, Southwest Western Australia. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, this is also a system dominated by annuals um, and we're considering this understory system below our gum and our jam trees. And so this project is in collaboration with Kath Fowler, Margie Mayfield, Topher weiss Lehman, and Isaac Towers, um, and was led by Kath as part of her PhD. And so it's in um, the Perenjoy Reserve. And for this study, we'll focus on 14 different species pairs. Um, they're all annuals and a mix of grasses and forbs. Um, and the questions and discussion afterwards, I'm happy to talk a bit more about our experimental design for collecting these data, but I wanted to focus more here on kind of the theoretical outcomes. So just a brief overview is to collect the data, we had um, kind of focal individuals of each of our 14 different species, so shown in orange here, and we had two different treatments. So one where we looked at seed production of those focal individuals with neighbors present, and then the second one shown in these dashed circles where we actually thinned out um, all competitors. And in particular, this really allows us to separate out potential um, interest specific competition effects from the maximum seed production for that lambda term. So using the system, we can go ahead and look at what might happen when we propagate variation using this Bayesian framework. So, from our traditional kind of mean only approaches, we can see that actually um, the vast majority of our species pairs found to commonly co-occur um, would be predicted to have one species competitively excluded by the other one. Taking this exact same data, but then using a Bayesian approach, what we find is that four of our 14 species pairs show um, distributions or show results that are distribution dependent. So where we have potential of multiple outcomes here. And to show just a couple examples of them. So here's one case where it's distributionally dependent. This is probably not that surprising for this gray species here. It's mean estimate falls right almost at zero. So if you expect some distribution with uncertainty around it, of course, it's likely to overlap zero as well as be positive. There's some really interesting other cases, however. So in this case, we would have neither species able to invade into the other one at equilibrium. But by considering these highly non-normal distributions for each of these different demographic rates, you now get this kind of heavy right tail for this gray species, where you do have a non-zero probability of coexistence where a mean only approach would not have given that result. And so I'll argue that when kind of considering the uncertainty of these frameworks and historically how difficult it's been to do restoration, propagating this variation might be really important to go from kind of the theory, more basic science standpoint to a restoration setting for coexistence theory. Okay, so that leaves kind of the second hurdle that I think is really important to overcome for coexistence theory, which is how we extend these methods for realistic observed diversity le levels. 
So this was a project um, as part of an IDIV working group, Estoration, um, which we started pre-pandemic. We had one glorious meeting in person before everything moved to Zoom. Um, and so we have a wonderful working group here. And I just wanna mention um, that this project was led by Topher weiss Slayman and Chaya Warner. Um, so Topher really did kind of the statistical approaches of developing this framework. And then Chaya led all of the simulation parts to test if our statistical model um, works, um, especially with these nonlinear systems. So in the California grassland system, the whole part of that talk focused on two species, one annual and one, or one grass and one forb. And that's always kind of bugged me a little bit with that study. And so what happens if we extend to consider higher diversity levels? Let's consider just six species. So nothing yet at realistic levels. And so if we consider six species, we'll need to consider interest specific competition for a species with itself. And then the effect of all five of our other species on that local species. Of course, when you fill in this matrix, uh, the number of these interaction coefficients we're estimating blows up really quickly. So for six species, we already have 36 interaction coefficients. Hopefully I convinced you from the first part of the talk as well, that these might vary across environmental gradients. So let's say we just wanna consider a simple line for what our interaction coefficient might, how it might change. And this might depend on our species pairs. So now we have 72 different estimates that we need to consider. And you can see this is highly unrealistic um, to be able to do in empirical settings. And so our question was, how do we overcome this? And so we borrowed from Bayesian sparse modeling approaches, which have been highly applied, especially in genomics and neuroscience, but not nearly as much within community ecology. And so to kind of walk you through what we do for this approach, the first thing is that we decided based on theory that estimating interest specific competition might be really important. So let's go ahead and do that kind of using traditional approaches. Then for all of these interest specific interaction coefficients, let's make at first probably a pretty bad assumption. And let's say they're all equal to each other. So we've colored them all gray. We're gonna say species identity doesn't matter. All interspecific specific interactions are the same. And then using this Bayesian sparse modeling approach, we can kind of let the model decide by having these priors, which interspecific competition coefficients need to be species specific. Or in other words, which of these kind of gray circles here are a really bad assumption and which ones instead do we need to consider species identity for? So um, this project just recently came out um, I'm not going to talk about simulations for method uh, validation, but just to mention, if you're excited about this, we did simulate a ton of data and the method seems to work pretty well at recovering parameter estimates. And instead here, I'll focus on kind of how we can use this in restoration settings and applications for it. So we'll again, focus on the York Gum Jam Woodland system in Australia. And there's a little bit to the system I haven't told you yet. And so that's in the system, but there's a couple key environmental gradients that we know really matter for probably coexistence and for community composition. So one of those is the gradient of shade. So how much shade is there from the gum and jam trees versus are you in a more open part of the canopy? And then the second one is that this is a highly fragmented system at this point with these reserves that tend to be surrounded by agriculture. And so in particular, having phosphorus runoff from the agricultural fields into the reserves um, really alter species composition and in particular seem to promote invasion of these exotic species. So we'll look at these gradients um, and actually look at two different reserves that differ in their overall rainfall amount. So Benderine and Perenjori from before. So before showing the results, um, what we'll kind of do here is focus on a key focal species. So Weizia cuminata, which is an annual native forb. 
And let's go ahead and allow um, these species interactions to vary in a log-linear fashion across our two different environmental gradients. So we'll kind of narrow in from this full matrix to looking at a single column of it since we're considering one focal species. And again, then we'll have these two different reserves um, doubling the number of parameters we potentially can pull out with this modeling framework. So using this sparse map, a uh, modeling approach, we can go ahead and first look at Weizia's density independent growth rate across this phosphorus gradient for our two different reserves. And what we can see for our native here is that as you increase phosphorus levels, you get a decrease in lambda for this density uh, independent growth rate. Then for, interest, for competition coefficients, looking at the same gradient, Let's go ahead and first look at our interest specific competition and then kind of that generic gray circle, if you will, interspecific competitive effect. And we can see that again, as you're moving to higher phosphorus levels, you tend to get this increase in interspecific competition on your Weizia native species. Additionally, we find across this gradient that interest specific competition is systematically higher than interest specific. And then adding to this, there were two different species, depending on the reserve, that kind of pulled out as these non-generic competitors to where it's really important to consider species identity. And we see that one of them kind of pulls out by being systematically more competitive than our generic, and another one as being systematically less competitive on Weizia than our generic. Similarly, we can look at the results for Weizia across our canopy cover. And we can see that at these um, lower canopy levels, you do tend to have higher um, lambda values. And then additionally, at these lower canopy covers, you have less interest specific competition as well. And here we also find that there's one species where considering identity is really important, while the others in the system, so all 45 other potential uh, competitors, you can kind of lump into this generic competitive coefficient. So taking these kind of two different statistical approaches that really dovetail with each other one really nicely, let's go ahead and do kind of a case study of how we might then apply them in restoration settings um, and how we can manage potentially for species persistence using these low density growth rate calculations. Just a reminder, we'll exper experiment if it's helpful to manipulate the abiotic environment so focusing on light levels and phosphorus conditions. If it's helpful to instead manipulate, say, the competitive environment or both. And so this will be, again, using those Weizia results. We do have this for uh, additional species as well, but we'll just stay consistent with Weizia. And we'll focus on one of our two reserves here. So just to orient you before kind of showing the different scenarios, if you have a positive um, value, that's your probability of persistence versus the amount of your distribution that overlaps zero is the probability of exclusion. And we can compare different scenarios. So observed to what happens if as a manager, you wanted to manipulate the competitive environment, manipulate the abiotic environment or both simultaneously. So as our baseline, let's go ahead and look at Weizia's low density growth rate under observed conditions. We do see overall that Weizia doesn't seem to be too much at risk. Most of its distribution is positive, though there is a bit of this tail into kind of the negative realm. And so this is given kind of the current gradient and environmental conditions, as well as competitive effects observed in this reserve. Okay, let's start playing with this using our modeling approach. Let's first go ahead and look at what happens if we decrease shade amount that seem to decrease interest specific competition and increase density independent growth. But what we can see is that given the system, there's actually really no effect for changing shade on Weizia's low density growth rate. This, however, is in direct contrast to instead manipulating the phosphorus environment. So let's now look at what we would expect if we can manipulate and kind of uh, decrease the amount of runoff from these agricultural fields into the reserves. 
And you can see that you have almost this doubling in Waitsi has observed low density growth rate in this scenario, and then in particular moving that tail to be more positive here. So this suggests that as a manager, really focusing on phosphorus runoff over shade could be really important for helping maintain Waitsia and increase persistence. Let's then go ahead and look at competition. And we'll just do kind of an unrealistic scenario to start with. So kind of a maximum amount if you caused competitive release. So let's look at what we would expect for Waitsia if you removed interspecific competitive effects in the system. That does indeed increase Waitsia's low density growth rate, but not nearly as strongly as if we changed the phosphorus environment. So this really tells us um, for kind of a management scenario that focusing on the abiotic environment might be better than focusing on the competitive environment. And then for good measure, let's go ahead and kind of combine this pink one and this green one and look at their overall effect. So if we decreased phosphorus and changed the competitive environment, it does have a little bit of a boost, but not too much compared to changing just phosphorus. And so this suggests to us that for Waitsia in particular, manipulating the phosphorus runoff would be kind of the best thing to do from a management standpoint. So going back to the three questions that I started the talk with today, from the California grassland part, we can see that environmental variability can be critical for species coexistence. Um, there's lots of other work, of course, showing this um, kind of across different systems, ranging from, say, protists um, up to grassland systems, even up to trees. Um, and in particular, though, from this study, it really highlighted to me the importance of considering these competitive environments and how environmental variability alters competition or species interactions. And so it's this interplay of environmental variability on species interactions and demography for kind of the net overall effect on what you expect for community coexistence. And then from the th uh, second part of the talk, we can see hopefully um, that it might be possible to take kind of coexistence theory and to use those ideas in particular thinking about measures of species persistence to hopefully inform management and restoration down the line. I'm sure there's many different approaches uh, and possibilities for how to do so, um, but I'm really excited about kind of this avenue of future work. Um, and hopefully today I've sparked your interest that Bayesian and sparse modeling approaches might be one avenue for doing so. Um, so with that, I want to thank my co-authors and funding sources yet again. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, and I'm excited for discussion and questions. Um, and then here's my email if you have any kind of questions or follow up offline as well. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand in the uh, participant list and I will call on you. So please go ahead if you have any questions. Yes, Chris, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, it's a great talk. Um, I totally agree about this, this idea that parameter estimates can be propagating the uncertainty forward. And we found a lot in our work that um, because the parameter estimates from these population models are correlated, you end up with these sort of really weird banana shaped posteriors um, in the kind of uh, niche fitness difference plane, which really changed kind of how we interpreted the results. Like you got this shape that kind of slotted quite nicely into um, one of the quadrants of this, this uh, phase plane, which kind of was quite different to when we just draw standard errors over the target of where the central point was. Um, but one question I really have is about how to look at to uncertainty in model form. So in this phase, if you just assume a kind of Everton Holt model, then you can kind of get some measurements of the uncertainty, and that's that's a wonderful. Um, but I wonder if when we might be overestimating our confidence in the unconfidence, or however you want to phrase this. So when we say like, oh, we've got a probability of 30% that it will coexist. We're probably more unsure about that than we're saying. So I just wonder where you kind of see that going to introduce uncertainty model form. Oh, what great questions. Um, make sure I hit on all of them and please re-ask, um, definitely. So yes, um, I love how you kind of brought up that a lot of these parameters co-vary really strongly with one another. 
And then also kind of when you propagate that into like looking at coexistence. So in that case, thinking of like the niche versus fitness differences and the like cone of coexistence. Um, I love your paper, Chris, and like notice then also how you do have like these distributions where they, they oftentimes kind of follow that line but are systematically higher. So it might be like close to the region of coexistence but in competitive exclusion. But when you propagate that uncertainty, you see that kind of following through. Um, for the paper of CAFs, we also did it um, in that framework too. And in some cases you get really kind of similar patterns, but not all of the species pairs, which we found really intriguing. Um, and then there's kind of two components to that. One is because these parameters co-vary, that's true of course, right? In a Frequentist versus a Bayesian framework. And so I really would argue like using these Bayesian frameworks, it's nice because you do have that covariation and you can propagate that covariation of your different posteriors. Um, the second point I'll make to that is that that's really highlighted to us the importance of experimental design as well. So one way that we get around it is either doing these thinning treatments that I mentioned for CAFS project or having single phytometers alone. So basically having some replicates where you can kind of remove all competitive effects and look at that density independent growth rate. And so having that then as some of your replicates that you give to your Bayesian model in our experience has really helped with breaking that covariation um, and kind of helping to inform in particular your lambda estimate. So then you can get better uh, competitive effect estimates as well. Um, so yeah, one kind of fun anecdote with that is in the simulations to test the sparse modeling approach, I don't know why logically this didn't kind of go with us, um, but in the experiments, it's like always have these phytometers without competition. And we forgot that <laughs> originally in our simulation approach and we had just this really strong covariation and it was like, oh yeah, we need to add that back in. So our simulations need to include the, these treatment effects, if you will, as well. Um, and then kind of the second part was like the model form, right? So the idea here is that, you know, we're assuming a specific model form. And so we can propagate uncertainty um, in particular um, using kind of these Bayesian estimates, but that's of course assuming a single model form and maybe that's a bad model for your system. Um, I think that's a really important kind of question as a group to reconcile with. Um, I don't know if I have the best answer there, kind of, I think probably that as my group too, we should be considering that more as well, um, rather than kind of using these traditional models for annual systems that have really nice historical precedent and that we've been using moving forward. Um, yeah, so I think that's actually a nice reminder, but I have to admit that we haven't really played with that, um, but I think is really important to consider, um, especially then for trying to connect to these applied settings. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, great stuff, Lauren. It's uh, really uh, moves this whole area of research uh, forward. Uh, it's kind uh, of it, coming to the seminar. I was anticipating asking certain questions and then you answered a lot of them and then Chris asked the other one. So, um, so I had to come up with a different one. Um, and it, I feel a bit sad asking this because, you know, you're doing, you and your group are doing so much to move the field forward. And now it's like, oh, but, but here's, what about this thing you can't, you probably can't do? Um, a lot of managers are going to care in particular about the rare species and keeping them in the system. Um, you're using Bayesian stats and sparse models to, to make, make this approach as minimize how data hungry it is but it's still quite data hungry and of course there's it, there's good reason why people have parameterized these models and run them through the LNR all approach have mostly worked with fairly common species um so if really what we want is to parameterize models for the rare species what do we do about that oh that's a great question um I'd love to hear what other people think about this too, because it is- No, no tagging off, Debbie. <laughs> no. You're the speaker. Um, <laughs> so, well, I do have some thoughts. One is kind of one really 
fun part that came out of the sparse modeling approach is that the yeah so if you have a really rare species right then you might be data limited kind of no matter what but what we found is that there was no correlation in terms of like the number of non-generic competitors that the sparse approach pulled out and the species abundance and so to in both ways right so is it like a common versus maybe I shouldn't say rare, but yeah. less common focal species. And then same actually, and I thought this was really cool with the neighbors. And so we actually had, right, we had 46 different species that were potential competitors with Waitzia. And some of those that pull out as non-generic are also not common species. And that's actually even more true for one of our other focal species um, that I did not show, but I do have the graph if people are interested. Um, actually, I'm just going to put it up because I really like this. So it's a little bit of a mess of the graph, but this is our other native. And in particular, kind of down here, all of these different brown lines are different species of competitors that pull out as non-generic. So what this says to me is that it's also can pull out these rare species that have these kind of disproportionate effects in terms of interaction coefficients. Um, and then I would argue kind of secondarily to your point, Jeremy, um, I don't know, maybe I'm not the best one to be making this argument, um, but yes, doing like these types of manipulation experiments of densities to then parameterize these models takes time, money and effort for sure. Um, but it's probably well worth it, I would argue, to then be able to kind of test whether or not you expect restoration efforts to work. Um, and so I would say even for rare species, right, you can find them, you could potentially do these manipulations and still then parameterize your model. And so really kind of putting in a bit of that time and money ahead of time um, for the experimental approach rather than this just like jumping in to try a restoration effort might be better use of money, um, especially given all of the known uncertainty with restoration efforts. So. that any any follow-up Jeremy or we're good no no I didn't uh, okay. you know me if I if I follow up I'll be taking up full time somebody else should okay take. sounds good um good answer Adam. okay thank you um Adam please go ahead um hi there can you hear me mm -hmm. all right sorry I managed to finally get COVID two days ago which I'm saying both for sympathy and to explain why I might sound like I'm dying. Um, but the uh, the this was such a cool talk and I'm I'm really excited to see what you find with this research program. I think that the fact that you're going after these aspects of, of coexistence theory from an empirical standpoint is really cool. And this idea of, of drawing on the full distribution of the parameters makes a ton of sense. I don't think it would have ever occurred to me before this talk, but it, it seems like a totally logical thing to do. And I suspect it makes a huge difference in how these, how these models actually play out. Um, the, the question I had through this whole thing is if the goal is to apply in particular Chesson's coexistence theory to empirical systems, that rests really heavily on the invasion rate implying something about coexistence and i think you can say that with pretty high certainty for theoretical models where you can prove that that's the case but like in empirical systems you have elite points and demographic stochasticity and like differences between regional and local diversity uh, uh, local and regional abundance that you can't necessarily measure and time lags and alternate stable states and so you have like lots of stuff that can make it very hard to take an empirically measured invasion rate and be sure that it actually tells you something about coexistence. And I'm just curious if if you have any idea of like how to deal with that, or maybe just don't think that it's such a big deal. I know I probably worry about this more than one should worry about it. Um, but it, it just seems to me a big challenge in trying to draw these things more into empirical studies. Yeah. Oh, such a great, such great comments. Um, I do worry about that for sure. I also think that it's like a pretty reasonable, exciting path forward. Um, and I think 
to make this a little bit more concrete, that's actually a lot of why I've gotten really interested in considering these underlying distributions because it can be distributions of many things, right? So for the, the last graphs looking at Weizia under kind of observed conditions, that takes into account that under the observed conditions, we already have these gradients in phosphorus and canopy cover. It takes into account that we have actually pretty high variability in terms of neighborhood density, as well as, of course, identity of neighbors um, in this high diversity system. Um, and so we're considering some of those underlying distributions. So for example, um, kind of your idea of like alternative stable states there. So maybe you do have in your system kind of multiple states represented. Um, if you have sampling kind of across those gradients, then that actually becomes this distribution of your background neighbors um, abundances that then you can incorporate and like also then include that in your estimates of these coexistence or persistence distributions. Um, similarly, right, you can look at this under kind of a deterministic model, or you can then say, let's also consider demographic stochasticity as well, especially um, for these invasion growth rates, and especially then potentially for these rare species. So how might that impact our persistence calculations when we know stochasticity, demographic stochasticity is especially important to consider at these small population sizes. Um, so I guess I'm excited about it because I think that there's a lot of different kind of ways you can incorporate that amount of complexity depending on your goal. And you know, there's a trade-off for sure with the modeling approaches, but I think that a lot of those you can at least incorporate here as a first pass. Um, the second thing is that I'm really excited. We haven't done this yet, but kind of following that feedback, following that loop, if you will. So right now we have experiments informing models but then it would be really fun to kind of then use that model output to inform potentially, hopefully if like a restoration effort was implemented, but even then to say, here's what our model predicts three years or whatever down the line, of course we have a different environmental condition. We might have variation in our competitive environments. How well did our model predict then what we see in the field? And I think kind of doing that full circle will be really helpful then for really pinpointing what complexities might it be okay to leave out and which ones do we really need to incorporate in our theory moving forward? No, cool. thank you very much. That's super helpful. And I think you've, yeah, I think in some ways maybe the you've managed to turn my question into Jeremy's question then. And that I, I think I agree with you that it's a question of, of data. And I suppose if you're able to feed enough local conditions and time steps and all that stuff into the model. Eventually these concerns start to melt away. But that, that's a much more optimistic answer than I think I've heard before. So thank you very much. Good. Try to, yeah, try to stay optimistic. The other, I guess, anecdote with that is with the sparse approach, you know, one really exciting thing, and hopefully this came across, is yeah, it's still a bit data hungry but it's way less data hungry than our traditional approaches. So it's not like, oh, I have additional data. I wanna use the sparse approach. It actually can work potentially in cases where your traditional models might fail and you just don't have the resolution for your, in this case, for your Bayesian models to converge, um, then a sparse approach actually might be helpful. So I think that it also can help kind of bridge this gap from theory to applied settings because it is a little bit less data hungry as well. Okay, thanks thank so you. much. Uh, Aksa, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Lauren. So at first I wanted to ask you about this beautiful picture you show on this last slide with all the colorful patches. Because I interpret it that, that here competition is highly um, scale dependent. So at, at a very small scale, always only one species can exist and the others can't and then it's like at one two meters several species can coexist and on the large scale lots of different species can coexist and and um, but then I, I don't feel like you will answer but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong about this you will answer well of course the parameters have a, have a distribution and therefore depending on what the parameter are is exactly you get a different outcome and, and, and then, and so I wanted to throw a second question in, maybe, maybe they are related, maybe not. 
Um, I'm a bit concerned that you're confusing the, the distribution of, of the uncertainty of what the parameter value actually is with an actual distribution of the parameter. And, and um, could you maybe explain this a bit more what you're thinking there is? Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Um, so the first one, so yeah, and like the York gum jam woodland system here. Um, yeah, I love this picture for showing that you do have really striking patterns across small scales. Um, and a lot of that also is like, so our, in particular, our gradient of shade is quite fine scale as well. And so a lot of this kind of the main ideas in these systems is that this is driven by these environmental gradients. So shade, phosphorus. Um, and then the other one, which I didn't talk about, which is really fine scale, is actually this kind of woody debris. And so if you have branches down, it really can change the microhabitat as well. And we've noticed these differences then in terms of species composition because of this really fine scale heterogeneity. Um, and you're right, I have kind of shoved that one under the rug for this talk. Um, but I would argue that is also an important one that anecdotally we know matters. So at what scale does your theory apply? So these scales, so we're kind of considering really small scale um, coexistence within, within an environmental gradient here. So the, um, oh, I should know this, I forget. The neighborhood rings are quite small scale. So we're okay. considering the focal right. individual mm -hmm. and a small scale environment. Yeah. Okay. And actually I think, this is a little wandery. I think that that's a really great question because um, under the mean approach, but then also the uncertainty one, we still get predominantly that we don't expect coexistence of these species. And that's true across a lot of these tests of coexistence. So the craft at all paper and PNA, PNAS comes to mind as well, where you get these species that commonly co-occur and using this framework, we don't yet get coexistence. We get a similar result then in this uh, this scenario here, and you're right, maybe it is like this small scale heterogeneity is really critical um, to consider to actually allow for then this higher diversity at the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, your second question then, on considering these distributions, um, yes, man, I would love to like disentangle all of that, but yeah, right now the distributions, um, kind of the way I'm thinking of them is kind of a, a bit of a catch-all, if you will, for um, knowing that these different de uh, demographic rates do have true underlying distributions to them. So if you had, say, um, clones of an individual, you still would expect probably some sort of distribution there, even if you've removed, say, that genetic variation. Um, yeah, so it includes uncertainty and kind of what we know as kind of these processes to create distribution simultaneously. And I agree that we can't disentangle them right now. Um, it could be a fun approach to apply in other settings where you can kind of tease apart different ones by using like clones, for example. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with you there. There are multiple reasons for this variability, some biological and some statistical. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, ben, please go ahead. Hi, Lauren. Um, thanks for a, a really nice talk. I really appreciated this, this approach to thinking about coexistence. And I think a lot of the things you're, you're tackling are ones that I'm, I'm trying to wrestle with in my own work as well. So I'd like to ask you two sort of interrelated questions that I, I haven't got a good answer for myself. And I'm curious what your perspective is within this modeling framework. Um, the, the first one is that you've, you've fit all of these, these very exciting models and you've made predictions for outcomes. Um, but as, as you mentioned in the response to Adam, the next potential thing to do would be to go in and try and validate those predictions, to go and try and see if, if the things you predict actually do happen in, in reality. Um, I'm curious if you're interested or able to do that in any of these systems and what you think might happen if you did so. And then the, the second question to go with that is that in many cases, the value of the model, um, as you argued in the second part of the talk, is for these management applications where you might be able to leverage some of this mechanistic insight into deciding what the best action um, to implement would be. But I, I have trouble with that in, in my work as well, because there's also the alternate route of saying, forget about the model. Let's just do an experiment where we take the system and we apply one of those treatments and see what happens. Don't measure any parameters. And then we just see which one of the outcomes is the best and then go, go do that, which is potentially a much lower effort um, route to the same sort of decision process in the end. Um, 
so I'd, I'd be glad for your thoughts on, on sort of is are you going to do experiments and what do you feel the value of those experiments would be? Yeah, really great questions. Um, so the first one with validating the models, um, I we have not. OK, we have not systematically done that yet. Um, so Margie's lab has at this point years and years of data, and she focuses on spatial variability, not temporal variability as much. So you could maybe kind of capitalize on like different experiments and use it in ways that data wasn't intended for of like, can you kind of validate the models that way? Um, but I think that's a really interesting thought. And a lot of the reason for not having done that is it it's kind of a new thought to us, right? So like looking at weight as low density growth rate, um, you know, this is stuff, it's very preliminary at this point. So it's kind of more like a dream of mine at this point, rather than anything that we've talked through thoroughly um, or even like much less started to implement. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to kind of hear about other people's thoughts there, but I think that kind of this back and forth might be really helpful, especially as we add more complexity potentially to our models and the idea of like, there's this balance, right? So which complexity is really important to include and really alters um, what we see um, in these, uh, when we validate our models and which ones might it be okay to kind of ignore for simplicity's sake. Um, does that answer your first question? Okay, can you repeat your second question then? The, the second question is on the management front um, and whether or not um, you see it being more efficient to fit the model and then um, predict the response of the system or to just simply apply the treatment and, and see what happens. Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe just applying the treatment is a really good way to go. Um, I would say that sometimes like specifically, right, if you're thinking of persistence, like it's it's a tricky experiment in some ways to do. So in this case, maybe you can capitalize on previous data in a system, especially if it's say like money or time limited um, or kind of augment, right? So we talked about how some of these parameters co-vary with one another. So maybe you could couple observational data downstream with then kind of a few targeted um, density independent growth rate measurements. And so that could be kind of a good way to go that might save money and time um, and help inform management. Um, kind of the second approach or second kind of thought with there that I know I just presented data for a single species. And right now what we're doing with this approach is so far looking at data for four species. So we haven't scaled up too much, but kind of overall eventual dream is that maybe then you could use these more like simulation based approaches to also then create like general predictions and ideas for the system, kind of with a more of a community context rather than a single species context that would be really tricky to do solely with experimental manipulations and kind of the scope would blow up pretty quickly. Um, so I see that it would be kind of longer term, but as one one potential reason for that. Um, I think kind of the second part is depending on the system, sometimes it's like, okay, there's money for management now. We need to do something kind of at this point in time, the money might not last for a long time. Um, and so if there's ways we can kind of capitalize on theory or simulation-based approaches to help inform, even in those cases, it might not be perfect, but like what would be the best use of that for kind of quick decisions, I think could be also really exciting. Thank you, that, that really helps my thinking, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Um, Nadav, your hand is up, but uh, yeah, I, I, okay. somebody else's hand was up as well, but I, I don't know if they, they might have had to leave already. So please go ahead. Okay, so again, thanks for the talk. It left me with a lot of food for thought. Um, something that you have mentioned, but uh, didn't elaborate on is this uh, inference technique in which you uh, infer the, not all the, uh, the interspecific interactions, but only some of them, right? So can you elaborate, can you give a few words on that or just give a reference to this method? Yeah, definitely. So, um, okay, just make sure I'm understanding. So with the sparse modeling- so you, 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 have, you have all the diagonal terms of the interaction matrix and now you assume to begin with that all the off-diagonal terms are equal, 
And then you have some criteria that allows you to choose, to pick the off-diagonal terms that you want to infer from experiment, if I understood it correctly, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yep, yep. Um, so yes, um, let me pull up a couple slides for you too, and then I'm actually going to answer your question here. So, um, so we have a ton more details of this in our recent paper, um, including all of kind of the statistical um, equations written out. So hopefully that's helpful. We also have code up on Zenodo to replicate everything mm -hmm. we've done for this okay. as well. Um, so that's kind of the where to go, but the big picture, how we actually do this, and I know I did totally black box it and say we let the model decide, is that we have these kind of hyper priors. Um, so we've taken this, it's a common thing to do in sparse modeling approaches. So like lasso is um, kind of a common one. And so we have what's, what's called a finished horseshoe prior. And so basically for each of our, we'll go here, um, or here for each of our interaction coefficients or each of these kind of gray ones there's actually an additional parameter there of should this be included as a non-generic and so that ends up becoming a zero or one so is it a generic one or does it need to be pulled out and be estimated additionally mm -hmm. um so from kind of a traditional sparse modeling approach approach um, what this is, is like, are your coefficients, say in a linear model framework, um, can you shrink them to zero? So can you drop that term? And we do that here as well, but it's more, it's can you shrink to zero, which is your generic, and then does it deviate systematically from that generic, and how does it, both um, in terms of the intercept and the slope as potential ones, so. Okay, thanks. I will try to look at the new project. Yeah, it was um, yeah, it was new to me, but it all kind of comes down to these priors using the sparse approach of like a zero or one of like should you include this additional parameter in your end model. Um, and so what we do is kind of here is kind of a two step approach. You don't necessarily need to do that. And so we do decide like which parameters need to be included, and then we fit a traditional model afterwards once we have that information. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, are there other questions? While people are thinking, uh, uh, maybe not a question, but something I I might want to say uh, to reflect on what Jeremy was saying earlier, and uh, it's uh, possibly a flawed idea because it's very difficult to really put a hard line between species that are rare versus not rare. But uh, I'm wondering if uh, one way to deal with the conundrum of rare species is just to change our modeling approach and say that for rare species, we treat them as rare enough not to have a huge influence on the community at large and instead take a meta-community approach where they are mostly affected by the matrix of species that they're surrounded by, but the rare species follow this sort of more classic meta-community framework where they always go locally extinct, of course, they're rare, but get recolonized. And that determines sort of what's happening with them. And, and so that they, they do it responding to the community at large, but not really influencing it because they are, they, they are rare. So I'm just, just an idea. I don't know what people think. Yeah, I really like that idea and I like that approach. Um, that said, I also think, yeah, there's a little bit more overhead kind of from a method standpoint, but with the sparse approach, you don't actually have to make that decision, right? And so That's you can true. just, if you have species with almost no data, like it's found once, it's probably going to be estimated as generic. Um, but again, like in, in some cases, we found that it was actually quite rare species that pulled out as non-generic ones. Um, but I think that that is a totally reasonable assumption, um, especially if you want to kind of keep with a little bit of a simpler framework and not have to dive into the sparse approach. Um, but I loved how with that one, you, you don't need to clump species that are rare and you also then don't need to categorize potentially by like functional group, which is one of our other, of course, kind of common ways of like taking that whatever 36 potential estimates and then being like, okay, well, these ones here are like 
invasive forbs versus invasive grasses and using kind of a priori um, groupings that we come up with. Yeah. Adam says that uh, uh, I, I, I think you just doubled down on Chesson's low abundance modeling assumption. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> you take it as you will. Uh, another thing, though, that reminds me that that might come uh, be related to what Adam was saying is that, of course, there's nothing in the sparse modeling approach that would make one have to uh, use it for uh, invasion based models, right? One could mm -hmm. use it for, for any. So if, if we're fairly certain that we can parameterize around some steady state, then, then we can do that. That's a really great point. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And I think, um, yeah, I present this a little bit of how the Bayesian sparse modeling framework kind of first came to us and like our pathway to it, but actually in that framework, there's nothing about coexistence in that paper. And so I think, you know, if you're excited about this, it does, it is kind of a method that can be used for anything you want to do with abundance models, looking at stability, or I guess I'm biased looking at synchrony, it might be possible too. Um, so it doesn't need to just be coexistence for sure. Thanks. Okay, any, any more questions? If not, then thank you again so much, uh, Lauren, for the very exciting talk and discussion that followed afterwards. So thank you. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming. And we will continue in two weeks. And it's going to be Lauren Hallett, I believe. Lauren, number two. So thank you again for coming. And uh, see you then. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It was a really Hello. fun discussion. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you, Lauren. Bye, everyone. Bye.